from Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. The soldier with faith in his country, in himself, and in his God is a good soldier. The Army considers that an opportunity to express that faith is a necessity for every soldier. The Army chaplain represents this opportunity. The Army chaplain, the man whose ultimate task is to keep faith alive under the most difficult of conditions. For the first story in our pictorial report today, we show you the role of the Army chaplain in combat. One of the soldiers had said to the chaplain, Quit your kidding, chaplain. You wouldn't go all the way up to that ridge just to pray. The chaplain had replied, No, not just to pray, but to bring God to men and men to God. The going was tough, but the chaplain finally made it. You might call it God's country. Bleak, rocky, barren. The sound of combat in your ears. Hardly a place where you'd expect a hymn and a prayer. Not just to pray, but to bring God to men and men to God, and in two languages. And when a chaplain did all of that, he filled a big empty space in the hearts of soldiers like these. Is this only one instance? No. This is typical of the combat chaplain in action. There was the time when a group of tank men had needed six weeks of instruction for baptism and confirmation. One of the soldiers had said to the chaplain, I'll be on duty, chaplain. Guess it'll have to wait. But the chaplain had said, on duty or off duty, son, I'll be there. And he got there all right. He followed those armored giants around for the whole six weeks of instruction. Yes, the combat chaplain goes everywhere, all over the front and right up there within sight and smell of shell bursts. Why? Why does he get around the way he does? Why does he even risk his life to get to the men? because they ask for it. And there's a saying that goes, man's importunity is God's opportunity. And you can bet your boots the combat chaplain is no slouch when it comes to taking advantage of an opportunity. not just to pray. In fact, not only to bring God to men and men to God, but to take an active role in every facet of a soldier's life, to be his friend, his mentor. A combat chaplain stands shoulder to shoulder with the fighting men of our army, makes it his business to see what the odds are for or against them. Many of the chaplain's activities must be so planned that they will not conflict with combat duties. But always ready and willing to lend a helping hand is the company commander. Take the matter of holding services. The CO will do his best to make the necessary arrangements. Time, place, attendance. 
Neither the chaplain or the men are particular what accommodations are provided. They can be makeshift or crude. The same applies to the Jewish services. Here it's the front end of a jeep used as a prop for the ancient tablets of law. Man's importunity, his own urgent request for spiritual comfort is God's opportunity. And the same goes for the Protestant services. It's all catch as catch can. The banks of a river may not feel like soft cushioned pews, but the word of God cushions the great doubts and problems. There was the chaplain who held his services in the marshalling yards of an embattled railroad depot with iron rails as seats. Here in the midst of twisted wreckage, the chaplain brought God to men and men to God. Suddenly, a fire mission. But the services continued uninterrupted. While our big howitzers shelled enemy positions, the chaplain kept up his own barrage. That's the way it goes all over the front. Here, within sight and range of enemy fire, the chaplain is a very humble man. He gets that way from being with men who together fight the common enemy and hug the deep and lonely silences. Day in and day out, he sees in their eyes a familiar look, as if he had the keys to the kingdom. And somehow he must show them those keys. If not the keys, then the door, or the path to the door. For men in combat feel the need of a comfort beyond their natural capacities. No, we're not back in the States. Just another example of man's importunity from top level down. The occasion is the dedication of a new chapel only a short distance from the battle area. to the glory of God, to serve all faiths. Chapels like these are sometimes put together with frontline leftovers, but more often than not, the only roof is the unpredictable sky. soldier has to do is express an inner need and the combat chaplain provides for that need such as communion for the Protestant communion for the Catholic or perhaps it's confession Besides providing opportunities for spiritual growth, the combat chaplain helps develop strength of character through character guidance lectures. Whatever the chaplain does, he does without an apology, because the men expect it of him. 
expected even more up there in the front lines at a time when the greatest courage and sacrifice is demanded of them. For example, when going out on patrol, as these men are preparing to do. Something to take with them and bring back. A capsule of good old Texas soil. But the chaplain has given them more than a memento from home to take with them. They take a prayer that they themselves had asked for and which they'll want repeated when they return. Something to look forward to, a visit by a combat chaplain. And he never comes empty handed. If he's not handing out testaments, he's giving out popular magazines and other reading matter, to say nothing of a warm and sunny disposition. Sometimes the disposition of the chaplain is not in keeping with the weather, but nothing seems to stop it. And there's always a need for him, especially in days of stalemate and seemingly endless waiting. The chaplain's very presence brings the words of the Bible to life. A chaplain once said, Men may believe in God, but sometimes God needs help in keeping that belief strong. The chaplain was referring mainly to men like these. So the chaplain helps out as a friend, sometimes pitching in when medics are shorthanded. He eases pain with a prayer and a note of encouragement. There's never a time when the chaplain isn't available. Here it's visiting hours for personal problems. This soldier has received a Dear John letter. You know, when a thoughtless girl will... I know this will come as a shock to you, but I can't help it. I don't care to wait any longer, you being way off there and me stuck away in this town with your family. Besides, I met a fellow to dance the other night. That's a bitter pill to swallow, but the chaplain helps the soldier so it'll go down easy. He opens new doors for him to express his faith and belief in human values like the care of the orphaned in a war-torn country. For I was unhungered, and he gave me meat. Naked, and he clothed me. And that's exactly what these soldiers have done. They've clothed and fed these youngsters, always the prime sufferers in a war of aggression. But soon the hungry of heart hit the trail with high hopes, Yankee style. As in every war. Great universal truths follow and sustain every American army. And one of these truths is freedom, here expressed in a thanksgiving service, followed later by all the traditional trimmings. No outpost or dugout is too inaccessible for a drumstick and a prayer. Another feast of freedom arranged by the combat chaplain is the Jewish Passover. 
Here, as in the days of old, is provided the unleavened bread, reminding soldiers of a terrible period of intolerance and enslavement in biblical history. And here is still another celebration of a feast of freedom, arranged by the chaplain. No battlefront is too wide or too narrow for Christendom's observance of Easter. With simple pageantry, the ancient story is told. The story of the rebirth of hope, Hope for peace, security, and goodwill. And now we swing over to Europe to see an example of how the army makes use of the scientific method in the detection of crime. Located in Frankfurt, Germany, the 27th Military Police Crime Laboratory provides the United States Army in Europe with a highly specialized service in crime detection. Military units throughout Europe bring to the laboratory evidence which figures in criminal cases, but which for proper evaluation requires expert analysis by highly skilled technicians using the most up-to-date scientific methods of crime detection. To show the operation of the laboratory in many of its phases, the big picture camera follows the reenactment of a fictitious but typical case from the time the evidence is brought by messenger from the unit requesting the analysis. The men who work in the laboratory are skilled, trained investigators whose jobs encompass both the role of detective and the role of technician. A photographer takes pictures of the fingerprints found on a bottle left at the scene of our hypothetical shooting. Meanwhile, in the fingerprint identification section, a suspect, enacted for the big picture by a Signal Corps soldier, is fingerprinted. His fingerprints are taken to a laboratory where they are carefully studied and compared with the fingerprints found on the bottle to establish whether he actually was at the scene where the shooting took place. A pistol found on the suspect is sent to the firearms identification section. Here, a technician, skilled in the testing of pistols, fires the weapon into a firing tube. This special device is filled with cotton batting to catch the bullets shot into the tube. The technician recovers the slug from the suspect's weapon. This slug is photographed along with the one recovered from the body of the man who was shot. The pictures of the two slugs are studied for comparison. In the chemistry laboratory, other experts gather the most minute statistical information from the suspect's clothing and from the clothing of the victim. Such clues as stains, dust, and particles of foreign matter reveal many important facts to those who are trained to interpret them. Perhaps the most graphic demonstration of the scientific aspect of crime detection is the use of X-ray equipment for analysis of various materials. In this highly technical operation, the atomic structure of the material under study reflects rays which are analyzed and converted into information about the components of the material. Then, a criminologist gives a lie detector test. Questions, emotional and routine, are asked. The suspect answers them all, while an intricate machine records the changes in heartbeat which the answers cause. The results of the test are studied carefully for significant portions of his testimony which indicate internal tension. Finally, all of the information is assembled into a report which goes back to the unit requesting the analysis. The court will eventually determine the suspect's guilt or innocence, and to help it reach its verdict, 
the court will have information about pertinent evidence which will be as exact as scientific inquiry is able to assess. Thanks to the efforts and the skill of the technicians who operate the 27th Military Police Crime Laboratory and similar installations elsewhere in the Army. War always leaves behind it, in addition to physical ruin, the seeds of further destruction. For our final report today, we will visit a unique school where military men are trained to ferret out some of these destructive seeds and remove them before damage is done. The Navy's Explosive Ordnance Disposal School, located at Indian Head, Maryland, has a curriculum of training for one of the most specialized and exacting assignments in the military service. Students at this school, which is closely guarded for security reasons, are training to be disposaliers, the men who recover and dismantle bombs and shells and other types of dangerous explosives. Because of the hazardous nature of their work, they are all volunteers. The school is operated by the Navy, which is charged with the responsibility of training Army ordnance men, as well as representatives of all the other military services. They learn to handle every kind of explosive ordnance, bombs of all types, hand grenades, booby traps, shells, and mines. In time of war, the Disposalier's mission is vital both on the battlefield and in cities bombed by the enemy. But even when the sounds of war are stilled, the training these men receive pays off. Over Mannheim, Germany, for instance, the look of peace has settled once again. The rubble that still remains in some parts of the city is the only visible evidence of the war that once flared here, and it is being removed as fast as clearing equipment can do the job. Day after day, the air is filled with the sound of machines going about the task of rebuilding the city. But suddenly a crane picks up an unexploded shell. The frantic foreman suspends operations. Jarred by this threat of destruction, he gets to the nearest phone and tells German officials what his workmen have uncovered. The German police, in turn, relays to the proper United States Army authorities, the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit, all the pertinent information about the deadly shell, its size, its type, and its location. Soon the bomb disposal crew, the disposaliers whose training has prepared them to meet just such emergencies as this, are on their way to the scene. Upon arriving there, they are met by the German police official who has been keeping order in the area. He greets the leader of the bomb disposal crew and accompanies him into the excavation where the shell lies. Once the disposaliers arrive, the situation is in their hands. It is the kind of job which permits no mistakes, for any mistake could be fatal. A rapid but careful examination reveals that the shell's fuse is still intact and that the shell is a real potential killer. Operations are begun immediately to have the shell rendered harmless and removed. A crowd gathers, watching tensely, while the officer in charge calls for the rest of the disposal squad. The disposaliers bring their special tools and gear with them. They are sure of themselves, but even so, each new unexploded shell is a new threat of sudden death. Then, deftly, swiftly, the fuse is removed, and the immediate danger is past. The excitement is over. Catastrophe has been averted. Mannheim can return to its peaceful tasks of rebuilding and clearing away the rubble of war. But for the disposaliers, the job is not yet done. Now the shell must be removed to the ordnance disposal dump where it can be destroyed. Still operating with the smooth sureness of a team well-trained, members of the crew secure the shell for its final trip. 
They fasten it safely in place, so there will be no danger during the ride. The sleeping giant is removed to the disposal dump, where the crewmen carry it carefully. Even though the fuse has been taken out, it is still potentially harmful, and the men take no chances with it. They take it to the detonation pit, where it is half buried in the earth, and dynamite is placed on top of it. A final check is made of the preparations for blowing, and then a disposal ear detonates the charge. The disposal ears in Germany close the book on this one. On the other side of the world, in Korea, the rubble of a more recent conflict also hides unexploded ordnance. To handle these hidden monsters, army men in Korea learn the job of disposal ear under instructors who are graduates of the school at Indian Head. The enemy in Korea left a variety of explosives behind, and these men study them all with intense care, so they will be able to destroy them once they find them in Korea's ruins. To aid them in this primary task of finding unexploded shells, Korean disposal ears master another important subject, that of child psychology. Candy and chewing gum are inducements the disposal ear uses to gain the confidence of the Korean children. Once they are friends, the soldiers can count on the children to tell them where shells, which the children regard as souvenirs, are hidden. True to the bargain she made with the American soldier, this little girl leads the way to the hiding place of a souvenir she knows about. A souvenir of war which lay waiting to claim an innocent life. In this slow way, the disposal ears are able to clear the Korean countryside of these death-dealing instruments. This is the kind of trade which makes the disposal ears' job a triumph over tragedy. A stick of candy for the life of a child. This is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to join us again at this same time next week for another look at the big picture, the United States Army in action. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.